Thank you. I want to thank Doug Parks for providing this opportunity for me to speak here before you, and I want to thank you for coming out because I have some very, very exciting information that I love to share with everybody, and this information really relates to what controls biology, and as Doug mentioned, I was a uh, cellular biologist uh, at the University of Wisconsin cloning human muscle cells. I was taking cells out of people, putting them into the tissue culture dish, and studying individual cells in an effort to understand what was controlling their fate, what was making them uh, dystrophic or pathological, what was making them normal and in the control process. In this uh, research, I started to come to an understanding that greatly differed from my whole scientific foundation that we were controlled by genes. And in the re end, the research let me in on the insight that it was the perception of the environment that controlled the cell. Well, in, in cell levels, perceptions are perceptions, but at human levels, perceptions are beliefs. And it turns out that it's actually our beliefs that select our genes and select our behavior. And the beautiful part about this, as Doug said, is it's life-changing for myself especially. I was uh, one of the genetic kind of people, and now I've transitioned my whole life into this so-called new age spiritual um, uh, science of belief. And the wonderful part about this lecture, outside of the fact that I will provide you with a molecular connection of how a belief actually switches on a gene so that there's no, like, empty boxes, no devotion in this place. This is actually just molecules. I'm going to get that across, I hope. Uh, but the beautiful part about this I, uh, is that in the second part of the presentation, a dear friend and colleague of mine, Rob Williams, is going to provide you with information and tools about how you can rapidly change beliefs. And belief changing is not that hard a process. In fact, it can be done almost in minutes. So there's uh, new science and new tools available. Uh, but before I start, let's get off with a, a truth statement. This is a very simple truth statement. Knowledge is power. The more awareness you have, the more capable you are of surviving and succeeding. Well, this is a truth, but there's another truth as well that goes with this picture, and that is lack of knowledge results in a lack of power. Why is this relevant right now? This question about lack of knowledge is this is that we all have been provided with information about our health being involved with our genes. We used to hear the stories, actually we still hear it on a daily newspaper, you might even find an article tonight that talks about the fact that the genes control the aspects of our lives. Well, we also recognize this, that we got the genes from our parents. And when you get genes from your parents and all of a sudden the genes control your life, then you find yourself to be more or less a victim of your heredity. If you find that there's cancer running in your family, then what do you start to get nervous about? My God, I've got genes in here. I'm a ticking time bomb. Something is going to go off and I'm going to end up dead or some problem is going to happen. Why? Not my responsibility. It came from my parents. Well, the problem with that belief system is it extends to another level. It says if you really can't do anything about your genes because that's what you receive from your parents, then all of a sudden you become irresponsible in the sense of like, well, I can't do anything about it, so why should I even try? And that's when all of a sudden all things go lost. And, and this is where this lack of power manifests itself because this belief about genes is totally disempowering to every one of us because it says you are less powerful than your genes. But what about the reality that this is not a true statement? And the fact is, well, let me explain what, I, what I'm talking about here. I'll start off with this. This picture of the DNA, almost everyone has seen this. It's been in school for so many years now. We're all trained with this. We see this on the media every day, that the DNA in your body, the genes in your body, provide for the characteristics of your life. So things not just besides your height, your hair color, your eye color, but things like anxiety and, and obesity and homosexuality and aggression and shyness and happiness are all characteristics that have been attributed to genes. And in this, if this is true, then the belief system, of course, is that when you got these genes at the moment of fertilization, your life was already established and all the rest of your life is just the unfoldment of the programs that you receive from your parents. So the genes, and we're going to talk some science tonight, but it's not going to be that difficult, so bear with me on it, because, I, again, I don't want to leave black boxes in here, empty spaces where you have to have devotion. I'm going to show you the connection. Uh, the genes, the DNA molecules, are found in the cell, in the individual cell, in a structure called the nucleus. So almost all people have seen a cell with a nucleus in it. And virtually all the genes are in the nucleus. As it says right here in this paper, which is in a recent issue of Science, this is one of the most prestigious journals in the world today, it says here in the first sentence on this article, which was dealing with the whole uh, issue dedicated to the role of the nucleus, first sentence, the nucleus is the command center of the cell. 
This is conventional belief, that the nucleus is the command center because in the nucleus are the genes, and the genes control you, so the nucleus represents that source of control for the cell. Well, the command center of the cell would be tantamount to the brain. As I used to teach in medical school to the medical students, the cells, and this is an image of a cell, just a cartoon image of a cell, the cells make us up. We have approximately 50 to 75 trillion cells that make our body. Interesting point I used to teach them is this. There is no new function in your entire human body that's not already present in every cell. Every cell has a respiratory system, a digestive system, an excretory system, an endocrine system, an integumentary system, a nervous system, a reproductive system, an immune system. Basically, what I'm trying to tell you is this that the cell and the human are structural functional counterparts of each other. Whatever is in the cell is in the human. Whatever is in the human is in the cell. So when I talk about the brain of the cell, or uh, the brain of the human, as that element that controls the command center of the human body, when I come over here and just read what we just read off the science journal that said the nucleus is the command center of the cell, this is because all the DNA is in here, then we get the assumption that the nucleus is the brain of the cell which is what you anticipate if it's the command center. Well, that's an interesting concept for this reason. I'll ask you a simple question, and the question is this. If I take the brain out of any living organism, what is the immediate and necessary consequence of that action? Death. Absolutely, it's going to die. So what happens if I go to the cell and take the nucleus out of the cell? Well, if the nucleus is the brain of the cell, by definition, the cell is going to die. Here's the reality. I remove the brain from any organism and the organism dies. But if I go to the nucleus and remove the nucleus from the cell, the cell is totally unaffected by it. A cell can live for two or more months with no genes in it at all. And it's not just sitting there. It's doing everything it was doing before we took the nucleus out. It's moving around. It's, it's communicating with other cells. It's eating. It's growing. It's, it's, it's able to uh, uh, eliminate waste and build up its structure. It recognizes toxins and moves away from them. Recognizes food, moves toward that. Basically, what am I telling you? I take all the genes out of the cell and I alter the behavior in no way. Meaning this, by definition, the nucleus cannot be the controlling center of the cell because the cell still has control with no nucleus. Well, wait, I took all the genes out and the cell still has behavior. The bottom line is that the genes do not control biology. This is a mistake. This is an assumption. It was made years and years ago. It was never proven scientifically, but it just seems so correct that we bought the story. And in fact, the cosmic joke just hit us not very long ago with the outcome of the Human Genome Project. Why was it a joke? And I'll tell you this. If the mechanism worked according to the way it's written in the textbooks, that the genes control biology, then there's the requirement that there has, has to be at least 120,000 genes to make a human. When the Human Genome Project's results were turned in, it turned out that there were only less than 35,000 genes. Over 90,000 genes are not present, which means this. It's not that the genes are absent. Our belief system was wrong. The genes do not control biology like we thought. So the Human Genome Project really pulls the rug out because they thought they were going to get the blueprint of how to make a human with all of these genes. And it turns out there are not that many genes. Two-thirds of the genes are missing, meaning we have to now understand a new way of looking at biology. Interestingly enough, though, the new understanding actually started to come out in the last 10 years. So everything I'm going to talk to you about tonight is science within the last 10 years. And the interesting part about it is this. It takes at least 10 or 15 years for science to take a fact from its first inception to get it out into the public so that the people can understand it. So anything in a textbook